And this is a message for bridal company members or those who want to be this series. Because the bride, in God's eyes, is great. She's special. To the groom, she's special. But what makes her special? What makes her great? It may not be what you think initially. To truly understand that, we need to go to the Word of God and study. The title of this message is, What is Greatness in the Eyes of God? Every child of God should want to know this and understand. If they love God, if they want to please Him, surely they want to be great in His eyes for that purpose. But to be great in His eyes, we must understand what it is that God counts as greatness. And it's right there in the Word of God, plain to see. Now, I will preface this answer by saying it is so important to understand what the Bible says about God. That is, God's ways and His thoughts are higher than human. They're not human ways. They're not human thoughts. He thinks differently than we do. So, with that said, what makes people special and stand out in the eyes of society, humanity, is not necessarily what makes people stand out and be special before God. What makes a child of God great? Is it their title, their position in the church, in the body of Christ? Is it the length of time that they have served God or have gone to church? Or is it the talents that they use to bless the kingdom? Or maybe it's the power of God that works through them. Could it be the many works and sacrifices that they make in the name of the Lord? Maybe it's their IQ, their personality, their great beauty. If you look at what the world considers to be greatness, athletic abilities, leadership skills, a life of building, a life of using their talents, whether it's in music and singing or in the film industry or in sports. So many of these people who had unusual abilities, talents, society would lift them up almost to worship them, to, almost to deify them. They were so great in what they did. Captains, rulers of countries who were great in battle, courageous, very strategic in their warfare, in their battle plans, have been magnified and lifted up to where today, thousands of years after the battle takes place, military people study how they did and worked and operated because these men were so great. What is greatness in the eyes of God? The answer is found in one word. And Jesus gave the answer himself in the 18th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Matthew 18, beginning in verse 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, 
except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You see what Jesus says here and carefully study his words because every word is significant. He said, except ye be converted, number one, and become as little children. In humility, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So it's not just about being converted. There are two requirements Jesus lays out. I'm not putting forth a new doctrine here. I am magnifying the words of Jesus. You must be converted and then become humble as a little child in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Humility is the answer. Now this may seem to be the incorrect answer, especially to a lot of people in our society. But again, this answer is Jesus' answer, the Son of God. And remember, again, I say God does not think like we humans do. His ways are higher than ours. This is one of the many reasons why Jesus came to earth to bridge the gap between fallen humanity and God. There was such a disconnect. But through Calvary, Christ provides the opportunity for humanity to reconnect with God. In other words, to get on the same page as God. So that in order to live lives once converted, to live lives well-pleasing in his sight. We have the word of God in print to study and learn about God because his ways and thoughts are different than ours. And this subject matter is proof of this, that God is not a man, he thinks entirely different. This subject matter of humility is proof of that. What God considers greatness is not what people consider greatness. Jesus prayed unto the Father to send the Holy Ghost to earth in order to live and dwell inside of children of God. And it's not just to be ready for the rapture. You don't get the Holy Ghost and then you're ready for the rapture. You get the Holy Ghost... He lives and dwells in you to fulfill the purpose Jesus said he would, that is to teach you, to guide you, to instruct you, to help you grow up in the Lord. Then you'll be prepared for the rapture. But you must let him serve his purpose in you. He is the spirit of truth. So when he does his work in us, he does his best work, his fullest work, his complete work, when we have truth abiding in us. So those Christians who put very little truth in themselves, the Holy Ghost is limited in what he can do, in what he can teach you, in how he can guide you, in how he can help you grow. Because again, he's the spirit of truth. He does his best work through truth. So if a Christian neglects truth, the Holy Ghost, his hands are tied. He can only do so much. But when you study to show yourself approved unto God, 
a workman that God is not ashamed of, rightly dividing the word of truth, the Holy Ghost has much to work with. In order for us to live this fruitful life and be a blessing to God and to people, we must have truth abiding in us. We must be doers. So to be clear, what people constitute as greatness is not what God constitutes as greatness. Because without God, His Word, and the Holy Spirit, people are carnal. They're simply carnal. God is spiritual. Humanity's thoughts and ways, being carnal, humanity's thoughts and ways are less like God and more like Lucifer. To best illustrate the theme of this message, we need to go to the Word of God to study the different testimonials, the different examples of humility and the lack of humility and how God responded accordingly. So to start, let's go to the greatest example. Ezekiel chapter 28, which details the fall of Lucifer. Here it is revealed how God made Lucifer of the highest order of angels, an archangel, dressed Lucifer in garments of precious stones, gave him special musical talents, great wisdom, and tremendous beauty. God also gave him special tasks to perform. Now, in human thinking, we, we would identify this as greatness. The Bible says Lucifer was created in perfection until iniquity was found in him. What produced this iniquity? The Bible says a lack of humility. A lack of humility is the origin of sin. In Ezekiel 28, 17, it says, speaking of Lucifer, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Some of the most beautiful people in our world physically, in the eyes of God, they're the most ugly. Lucifer's pride was the origin of sin. It was not enough that God lifted Lucifer up. Now Lucifer was determined to lift himself up, even above God himself. In lifting himself up, this is what Lucifer was determined to do. In Isaiah 14, verses 13 and 14, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Again, I say humanity, who has been born in sins and iniquity, their thinking and ways are more similar to Lucifer than to God. And we see, as this world grows darker in sin today, this mentality is percolating in our society more and more and more. Just as Lucifer declared himself in Isaiah. Especially among the elite, the rich, and those who have power and talents in their own way, rising up against God. Think again now what Jesus said is greatness in God's kingdom. To possess childlike humility.
And many Christians know this. I mean, it's in the Bible, they should know it, but do they seek to live this way? How many in the kingdom have taken it upon themselves to seek out the greatness of God? What God counts as greatness. Let's examine other characters in the Bible to further demonstrate this subject matter, to further confirm what I speak to you. Moses called of God to deliver his people out of Egyptian bondage. Such power he had with God unlike most people ever knew in this world. Think about it. All the plagues in Egypt, separating the Red Sea, the many miracles of supply in the wilderness for the nation. He, God spoke to him in the burning bush. In fact, Unlike every other person, Moses saw a part of God while he was in the flesh. He saw the backside of God. Now, all of this, we would read and we'd consider, what a great man of God. Wow. All of this that he did. This is amazing. This is tremendous. He was truly great. But what is it that made Moses great? Really great? The Bible tells us what made him great. And it's not what you may think. It tells us in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. Now the man Moses was very meek, above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. In other words, he was the meekest man that walked the face of the earth in that day. This is what made him great in the eyes of God. This is why God could use him the way he did. He was the meekest, most humble man upon the face of the earth. And if you think about his life and what led him to the place that God did use him the way he did, in godly fear and humility, Moses walked away from the house of Pharaoh. Moses could have been one day, in the eyes of the world, the greatest man. In the eyes of the world. He could have been, but he walked away from it. He walked away from Pharaoh's house the most powerful family upon the earth, the most greatest nation upon the earth. He walked away from the riches, the power, the fame, the glory. Walked away from it. To be a lowly shepherd in the wilderness. And Moses had no idea what God's plan was and how God would use him. He did this of his own accord. Because he feared God more than anything in this world. It was at this point, after expressing that humility, it wasn't just talking humility, he demonstrated it. After demonstration is when God put Moses in the place to be what he would be for God's people. Because God could trust him now. But now there's an important lesson to learn. And never forget this lesson. You can humble yourself before the Lord. And God can use you, but you better stay humble. Or God will not use you.
In fact, he will punish you. Learn a lesson from Moses. The one time, the one event in which Moses lacked humility, it cost him the promised land. It, prom it cost him the goal he was reaching for. In Numbers chapter 20, Moses was leading the people through the desert. And there was no water there for the people and the animals. So the Israelites, as they were prone to do, gathered themselves against Moses and Aaron to criticize them. So Moses and Aaron go into the tabernacle of the Lord. They fell upon their faces before the Lord. And God gave them specific instructions. Take note, every word God gives is important because every word he speaks is important. God told them, gather the people together, speak unto the rock before their eyes, and the rock shall bring forth water. This is what happened. In Numbers chapter 20, verses 9 through 12, And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, not the rock, he's speaking now to the people. Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? Now take note here what Moses is saying. Must we, must me and Aaron, fetch you water out of this rock? Moses is speaking as if he's the miracle worker. Why do you trouble us with this? Now we have to get up before this rock and make water come out for you. Verses 11 and 12. And Moses lifted up his hand. And with his rod, he smote the rock twice. God gave no instruction about smiting the rock. God said, speak to the rock. And the water came out abundantly. And the congregation drank, and their beast also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, Therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. It's a shame and it's unfortunate for Moses. He gave his life for those people, yet they consistently showed a bad spirit. Unappreciative to God and to his servant, Moses. So by this time, Moses is so vexed in mind and spirit. Before God and before Israel, he loses that spirit of meekness. And when he does, he disobeys God. God said, speak to the rock and it will yield water. However, in anger, God spoke idle words to the people. Or excuse me, Moses spoke idle words to the people. Failing to sanctify God before the people, then smiting the rock twice. Another lesson to learn, be careful with your words. Be careful in what spirit you speak words. Jesus himself said we would be judged by every idle word we speak. Look at the judgment that fell on Moses for basically losing his cool not staying in the spirit of humility that he lived his life in, and the one time, the one time, it caught up with him. Moses disobeyed God, failed to give God glory for that miracle. Instead, Moses' words glorified Moses in the eyes of the people. 
must we fetch you water out of this rock? Moses and Aaron had no, they were not the miracle producers. In fact, if it wasn't for God, in God's will, we would have never heard of Moses or Aaron. Moses would have lived and died out in the wilderness, tending sheep, if it wasn't for God. Anytime the Lord uses a bridal company member, always remember you're just a vessel, just an instrument, nothing more. Because as Jesus said, without him, we can do nothing. Now let's look at King Saul. God chose this young man to be the first king of Israel. What a privilege. What an opportunity. But why would God choose him above all the many people in Israel? What was it about Saul? In the beginning, he was humble and meek. Before being anointed by Samuel to be king, Samuel speaks to Saul of the great favor upon him, the great favor of God upon him and his family's household. But what was Saul's reply to this? He's perplexed. I and my family are of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. And not only that, Samuel, but my family is the least of the smallest of tribes. So in other words, Saul is categorizing he and his family as the lowest family in all of Israel. And he cannot understand why God would choose him. Later when the people would crown him king, he ran from them and hid. Feeling unworthy of this Great responsibility. And he was unworthy, but God would make him worthy. Unfortunately, at some point during his reign, we don't know exactly when, Saul lost his spirit of humility. Again, you can lose humility if you're not careful. It's one thing to humble yourself before the Lord, but it's another thing to live in that humility before the Lord and before people. At some point in his reign, pride and ego took over. And by this, by this is he failed. Because Saul feared man more than he feared God. He cared more about what people thought of him than what he wanted God to think of him or how God thought of him. So God tests Saul again and again. And each time Saul fails the test. Finally, God rejects him. From being king. This is God's message to Saul through his prophet. 1 Samuel 15, verses 17, 28, and 35. Carefully study these words, these are significant. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. I like that. What an unusual way God puts this in describing humility. If you're unsure of what humility is or how it's to work and perform, look at God's definition. When thou wast little in thine own sight. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day. And hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. Oh boy, those are some harsh words. When God says someone else is better than you. 
And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he made Saul king over Israel. To lack humility to the point that God even repents, he called you to do anything for him. But notice God's words, when you were little in your own sight, you were made king. But when he lost that humility, it caused God to repent. He made him king. Little in your own sight. The next time you examine yourself in light of humility, use that phrase. How do I view myself? How do I view myself? You know, the Bible instructs God's children not to think more highly of oneself than they should, but to esteem or count others better than yourself. Examine Job. Recently, the preachers have been bringing Job before you. Here's a man of great humility. Job 1.8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Now this is, this is interesting. God says this about him. Perfect. Above everybody on the earth. And you know what? There's nothing recorded about Job's life, of any great works he performed, any great power that manifested through him, any unusual special talent on display? No. We only have record of the devil coming against him. That's all we know about his life. So what made God say this about Job? What was it about him? that God could speak so confidently about Job to Satan, God's arch enemy. Again, there's a number of qualities Job possessed beyond fear of God and avoiding evil, one of which was humility. A quality, this is a quality that Satan put to the test because Satan was determined, as he said to God, to make Job Curse you to your face. This is what I'm going to make Job do, God. He will curse you to your face. Job's great humility was on display in his darkest, most trying hour. That's when it counts. Not when all is going well. Not just lip service. True heartfelt humility. On display when all of his possessions were either destroyed or stolen, his servants killed, all ten of his children killed, and then, here's the key, everything is blamed on God. It'd be hard enough to swallow all of that when the blame is on Satan or people, but when the blame is on God, how do you swallow it? I've heard stories of people who lost one child that they loved dearly through unfortunate circumstances and that they, they would literally turn on God, have nothing to do with God the rest of their days. Job lost 10 at one time. 10. What did Job do when he received the news of all of this happening? Job 1, 20 through 22. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshiped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. 
The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. When you have heartfelt humility, there's nothing that the devil can do to move you away from God. Nothing. And Job proved it. This is greatness in the eyes of God. Again, I say many people in this world have endured far less than what Job endured, only to become angry at God, turn from him, and yes, even curse him. But not Job. Job rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell to the ground and worshipped. All of these are outward expressions of his heartfelt humility. Every one. Symbols of his humility before God. Then when his wife and family forsook him, his flesh covered with boils, the Bible says he sat on a pile of ashes and he scraped himself. Sitting on ashes is another Old Testament sign of humility. Later, his friends came to falsely accuse him of sinning against God. But the more that took place with Job, the more he humbled himself. Just when you think you can't bow any lower, God will make room for you to bow lower. If you have the heart to do it. Jesus said, Matthew 23, verse 12, Jesus says this, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased or brought low, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. At the end of Job's trial, God did just this. God set the record straight with Job and his friends. I'm not the cause of your troubles, Job. Do you hear this, friends? I am not the cause. Job is my true righteous servant. Not you. You have falsely condemned him. He confronted them with their false accusations and misrepresenting him. And then God instructed them to go to Job, offer sacrifices, and then he will pray for you. God didn't even have to ask Job. God knew what Job would do before Job did it. Because God knew his heart of humility. He would pray for them, even though they had turned against him and caused him so many griefs with their words. And when Job did, God turned his captivity. And he gave him more than what he had before. Job prayed for those who falsely accused him and condemned him. Is not this what Jesus has instructed his followers to do? To pray for them who despitefully use you and persecute you? Love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Bless them that curse you. You know, a lot of God's children struggle to fulfill these particular commandments about loving and blessing and doing good to those who do you wrong. And in my prayer time, I believe the Holy Spirit gave this to me. It's not that many of these children of God who fail to do it, it's not that they don't possess the love to do it. They have that love. But in that moment, when that love is to be used, they lack the humility to use that love. That love is there to be used, but they don't use it because they lack the humility to use it. Humility before God 
is so important and necessary. Even when sinners and backsliders are full of humility, God will raise them up in a mighty way. Psalm 147, 6. The Lord lifteth up the meek. He casteth the wicked down to the ground. This is a wonderful picture of the history of Old Testament Israel. It was a continual cycle for this nation. When the nation feared God, honored Him, and walked softly before Him, and that's just an expression of humility, to walk softly before the Lord, God would bless the nation, prosper them in every way, give them victories over their enemies. There wasn't anything God wouldn't do for them. Then over time, they would take their ease, become satisfied in their flesh. They would lose their love for God, their fear for Him, and their humility before Him. Then turn aside in pride and deceit and selfishness. They would become carnal, become more like the devil than God. Then they would go after idol gods, devil worship, all of those carnal sins associated. Then God would rise up in judgment and cast them down for their wickedness. Every time they would humble themselves, cry out to God, seek Him in His face in fastings and prayer, God would hear and bring deliverance, raise them up and bless them, only to see that cycle of sin and disobedience start all over again. You know, a point I want to make and interject at this point, the practice of Bible fasting. We must understand what fasting is all about. Okay, there's a reason why we're taught to pray, fast, and live in the Word. It's not just do it because the preachers say do it. Everything you do, prayer, fasting, living in the Word, there's a purpose behind it. Growing in the Lord. And so many Christians, they don't understand the purpose of Bible fasting. They're just told to do it. So they don't include fasting in their walk because they don't see the necessity and the importance of it. This is spiritually dangerous when you keep fasting out of your walk with the Lord. Because Bible fasting is a God-given method. A God-given method, not man-given. A God-given method to help keep a person humble and under subjection to the word and will of God. Psalms 35, 13 says, I humbled my soul with fasting. In Bible fasting, you afflict soul and body before the Lord. You afflict yourself outwardly and inwardly before the Lord. Bringing your human spirit under subjection to the Holy Spirit, depending on the meat of the word for life and strength, instead of food. Daniel 9, 3, I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fastings and sackcloth and ashes. Again, in Bible days, wearing sackcloth and ashes, an outward expression of your humility unto God. So here Daniel humbles himself within through Bible fasting, and he humbles himself outwardly with sackcloth and ash. What was the result of this humility before God? The angel Gabriel came unto him, delivering a message, O Daniel, thou art greatly beloved of God. Then proceeded to give him a mighty revelation about the nation of Israel. And the 70 weeks of years determined by God against them. All of which has yet to be fulfilled. Remember the story of Jonah. Jonah the prophet. He's a prophet of God. He lacked humility. Did he always lack it? We don't know. But at this point, 
in his life, in his ministry, he lacked humility. He did not want to do the will of God. He did not want to warn the wicked city of Nineveh of God's coming judgment. He disobeyed God. So in disobedience, God sends a whale after him to swallow him up for three days and nights. Finally, in the, well, in the whale's belly, he humbles himself before God and decides to obey God. So, with that, God moves upon the whale, goes up to the shore, spits him out. And he goes to preach to the people. After preaching, God spares the city in great mercy and compassion. Yet Jonah is upset with God for this decision. Who is Jonah to have any right to be upset with God? God can do whatever, whatever he wants, and his servants should be well satisfied with it. He's upset with God. And notice, you know, when you lack humility, your perception is really distorted. Because Jonah was so glad to receive God's grace and mercy for him when he humbled himself. He's glad to get out of that belly of the whale. But yet, he's dissatisfied with God when they humble themselves and God shows mercy. That doesn't add up. How often have Christians thought too highly of themselves? And a lack of humility before God and man caused the whale of troubles and tribulations to swallow them up. God thinks on a throne, if they're not going to humble themselves, in great love, I've got to try and help do the job for them. I hope by these examples today you see how a lack of humility in your life can then eventually lead to a lack of love, a lack of obedience, a lack of godliness, a lack of respect and honor for God and his children. And it all starts with a lack of humility. A lack of humility will cause God's children to lose sight of the fact that all we are is just servants, servants of the Lord, living our lives ordained to do God's will. That's why we're here. Now let's contrast Jonah with the city of Nineveh, wicked and violent. If you study this empire, they were terribly wicked and violent. Study them in history. When God warned through Jonah of God's coming judgment, the Bible says the king did this. He stepped off his throne, took off his royal garments, covered himself with sackcloth, and he sat in a pile of ashes. Again, all outward expressions of humility. But not only that, this happened. In Jonah chapter 3, verses 7 through 9, speaking of the king, and he, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? They did terrible works, terrible works in society throughout their kingdom. But when they sincerely humbled themselves before God in their hearts, God showed mercy. I want you to consider this thought before we close today. Take it to your prayer closet. At the end of this story, here we have this, 
king of Nineveh, and Jonah the prophet. If both would have instantly died at the end of that story, who do you think would stand before God justified and enter into paradise? And who would have been cast into hell? Again, consider these questions in light of what Jesus said about the kingdom of God. It is so important to learn God's thoughts and ways because they are perfect. Friend, watching this message today by way of the live stream, how do you view yourself? What is in your heart towards God and others? Because if there is anything in your heart, in your life, if you have a distorted view of yourself that is not in line with the Word of God, it's time to humble yourself greatly before Him and give your heart and life to Him. And through the blood of Jesus, He will lift you up. To be a servant unto him. To do his will and to please him. You won't be great in the eyes of this society. You will be great in the eyes of your God. And that's all that should matter. Pray this prayer with me right now. Say, O oh God, save my soul. Forgive me. For all of my sin, I am so sorry that I have sinned against you, that I have failed you, but no more. I will serve you the rest of my life. And I believe there is power in the blood of Jesus that washes away all of my sin. Say, come into my heart, Jesus. Come into my heart, dear Jesus. And amen. And if you meant that prayer, Jesus is yours. Friend, whatever that need is in your life, you put it in the prayer in the comments section. We're going to pray over all of your requests. Maybe you're sick in body. Maybe you want prayer for someone else in need. Even if you didn't put that prayer request in the comments section, lift up your hands. Put your hand against mine on the screen as we look to Jesus. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before your throne of grace. Lord, we come only because of Jesus. He made it possible. And we thank you for his blood and his sacrifice. Lay a healing hand upon each one. Heal them and set them free. We honor the power in the blood of Jesus. We honor that great sacrifice. O oh God, lay a healing hand upon each one. Let the Holy Spirit apply the blood to cover their need, to heal them now. In the holy name of Jesus, heal, heal, heal them and set them free. We'll give you the honor, the praise, and the glory. And amen. And friend, watch every sign of improvement and give God glory. And those of you here today, if anyone is in need of prayer, now is your opportunity to stand to your feet. Go over to the side and I'll be there to minister unto you. And the rest of you, stand to your feet and come to the altar today. Present yourself before the Lord. And those of you joining this service online, wherever you're at, church, at home, stand to your feet as well. Present yourself unto the Lord. Lift up your hands unto the Lord and let the Lord anoint you today. Let him bless you. And if you're without the Holy Ghost and you're a child of God, friend, it's time to receive. This is God's gift unto you. It's according to the Word of God. He'll give the Holy Ghost to the obedient. And you can receive the Holy Ghost today. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, anoint 
the people now to receive this precious gift from on high, your gift of the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, Lord, anoint them in a mighty way. Anoint them in a mighty way, Lord, to open their heart's door to receive the Holy Ghost and start praising the Lord, friend, wherever you're at. Start praising Him, glorifying Jesus. Praising Jesus, glorifying Him. And don't stop till the Holy Ghost comes in. Let the Holy Ghost come in. Let Him take over. Let Him move for you and fill you in the name of Jesus. Praise in Jesus. Love in Jesus. Glorify in Jesus. Praise in the King. Praise in Jesus. Love in Jesus. Lifting up those praises. It's you and Jesus. Just you and Jesus. Glorifying Jesus. Praise in the King. Just you and Jesus. Keep your mind on Jesus and know that He's with you. that power go all through your body, glorifying Jesus. Praise in the King, praise in Jesus. Lifting up those praises, lifting up those praises. Just you and Jesus, just you and Jesus. that love, beauty to that grace, glorify in Jesus, praise in Jesus, praise in the King, praise in the King, just you and Jesus, just you and Jesus, love in Jesus. Up those praises. 